Thank you, Melissa. And good morning, everyone. Aloha and Happy New Year, and welcome to the kickoff of a brand new year. How's everybody doing? How are we feeling about a new year? Amen? Excited? Half of us are excited. And I'm right in the middle with you guys. I, I am excited, and yet there's like something else going on also. I don't know what it is. It's a little... It's a little trepidation, I got to say, and I couldn't quite put words to it, but something happened to me recently that I think kind of describes what I'm feeling about another year. So I was driving up to church early one morning, and because it's winter time, the sun was still tucked beyond the horizon. But I'm coming up from Haleiwa, and I can just see the light hitting the top of Mount Ka'ala. If you know the drive I'm talking about, right? As the sun rises, the light is just hitting the top of Mount Ka'ala as I'm driving past the pineapple fields toward Dole. And the sky is starting to brighten, and the country is awakening all around me, and I am just soaking in the beauty and the grandeur of this brand new day. But right as I'm having this moment, something gets my attention in my rear view mirror. I look behind me and a set of headlights has appeared and there is a car driving up the hill and gaining on me fast. And I, I look down at my speedometer and I realize I'm going the limit, but of course, in our culture, going the limit is slow and going 10 over is the norm. So now, this feeling of tranquility, this feeling of serenity has been replaced with a new feeling. Hurry. I don't want to be in the way. I don't want this person to have to overtake me. I don't want to be an obstacle, a Sunday driver. So involuntarily, I just begin matching their speed because I don't want them to have to overtake me. And in this moment of urgency... The moment is completely lost. And as I embrace this urgency, my mind automatically shifts to all of the responsibilities and to-dos that are waiting for me once I reach the church. And that beauty that enveloped me mere moments ago just completely fades into the backdrop of responsibilities and to-dos. As I thought about that, I thought, you know, Sometimes that's how the new year can feel, right? We just want to be in the moment. We just want to embrace the dawn of a new year. But the tasks, the to-dos, the responsibilities, and the expectations that come with a new year can feel like a hurried driver bearing down on you. And your soul tells you to slow down, to go at a slower pace. But of course, our world says... Slow is unacceptable. Your soul tells you to just stop and be present in the moment and to take it in. But our world says stopping is out of the question. I love the way one sister put it. In our time of daily devotions this past week, we've been having such a rich time of daily devotions as a church. And one sister in the church beautifully reflects Rest in Jesus is something I wasn't able to do. Our technology brings us too much stuff. Nonstop work, social media, friends and family in the palm of our hands never gives us a break. It seemed like the right thing, but it took away my time for Jesus. This year, I want to intentionally rest in Jesus and learn from him together with our new Hope Ohana. How many of you would say amen to that sentiment for the new year? Hallelujah. Yes, and you're not alone. I believe there's a growing resistance to the status quo of how our world says we need to live. See, our world would tell you that in this new year, you better go harder, faster, stronger than you did before. Rid yourself of all dependency. Be a self-made woman, a self-made man. Chase the latest. Get up and get after it. Which is what makes Jesus' invitation so profound. Because Jesus would say to us who are following him in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, 
All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. One of the things I love about this passage that I just caught this past week is you notice Jesus does not say, come to me all you who were weary and burdened. He says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, meaning you don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to get yourself together. You don't have to offload your burdens before you can come to Jesus. You can come to him just the way that you are. With everything going on, just come to him and he will be the one who gives you rest. See, Jesus is inviting us into a different pace of life. He's inviting us into an entirely new way to live. This weekend, we kick off a brand new series that is centered around our theme for the entire year, and that is to abide. This year, our focus is simple. We want to be with Jesus, we want to become like Jesus, and we want to live the way that he lived. Amen? Our, our verse for the year comes from John chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So notice Jesus doesn't say, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you strive for me, you will bear much fruit. No, he doesn't say strive for me. He says abide in me. You see the difference there. You see, our world would tell you that you need to strive to thrive. But Jesus is saying that's not the case. If you want true fruit, then you have merely to abide in him. So this year, don't strive. Abide. Because striving leads to dying, but abiding leads to thriving. Amen? And so we want to abide and thrive as we remain on the vine all year long. That is going to be our meditation and our focus. And what we saw last weekend is that abiding is really more than just a weekly immersing. It is a daily submerging. And the Lord gave me a different picture for this, right? Because we talked about remaining in Christ, right? Almost like uh, kimchi or like sauerkraut or like how uh, when you pickle, you have to marinate. You can't just dip the cucumber in. You have to let it sit in the brine in order for it to become a pickle. In the same way, we want to marinate in Jesus and remain in him so that we can be transformed. And the Lord gave me a picture yesterday. So I had to scramble to get all this stuff together because God gave me a picture for what this looks like. You see, the Bible talks about being sealed in the Holy Spirit. Being sealed, it's like that pickle jar, right? Those cucumbers just have to be sealed in there. And they can't come out, right? And if they do, they won't pickle. They'll just stay cucumbers, right? They'll, they won't transform. And so what happens when we're not sealed in the Holy Spirit is we're a lot like this guy. This is Luke. His last name is Warm. <laughs> and Luke Warm is not sealed in the Holy Spirit. He's kind of a one foot in, one foot out kind of guy. And so because he's not sealed, what happens is he comes to church and look, he gets filled with living waters, right? He gets filled. He's filled with joy now. He's filled with hope, right? But because Luke is not sealed, what happens is on the way home from church, someone cuts him off. And he gets a little rattled. Ah, oh, ah, oh, hey, brah, watch where you're going. Oh, and look, some of his water came out. And then Monday morning comes, he's stuck in traffic. There's an accident on the H2. And the devil says, watch this. You thought yesterday was bad. I'm really going to put the pressure on now. And all the devil has to do is just squeeze Luke a little. I'm even a child could come up and do this. It doesn't take much. Just a little pressure. And look what's happening. All of Luke's joy, all of Luke's love and hope is just beginning to gush out. 
He's just losing it all, right? And now look, he's bent out of shape, look. See? <laughs> and then what happens is the devil brings sin and temptation. And again, because Luke is not sealed in the Holy Spirit, look what happens. That sin just starts to get all in there and taint his living waters. Look at that. And now what happens is he was a wellspring of joy and of life, but now ugh, everybody who runs into him is like, ugh, peel out this guy. Look. <laughs> and look at that, right? Does this look like someone who's thriving on the vine? Does this look like the Christian life we want to experience? No. We don't want to be lukewarm Christians in 2024. Instead, we want to be like Kim. Kim Chi. Because <laughs> Kim Chi is sealed and she is marinating in Jesus. And look, she's sealed in the Holy Spirit. And Kim will go through the same bumps and knocks as Luke does. But look, when Kim gets knocked around, nothing happens. And then the devil comes. He's like, okay, you think you, think you got what it takes? Well, I'm really going to put the pressure on now. And he comes up here and he tries to squeeze Kim. But Kim is pressed, but she is not crushed. You see that? She does not lose any of her joy. The devil can turn her upside down. But because she's sealed in the Holy Spirit, because she's remaining, because she's abiding in him, nothing can get to her. The devil can throw all the temptation and sin he wants. And yeah, she might get a little scuffed on the outside, but look at the inside. She's pure. She's holy. She's remaining in Jesus. How many of you want to be like this? In 2024. Amen? And that is what it looks like to abide and to remain. Colossians chapter 2 puts it this way. Paul says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, here it is, continue. Everybody say continue. 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 Turn to your neighbor and say continue. Continue, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. What Paul is saying is, putting your faith in Jesus, making him your Lord, is only the beginning of the Christian life. But the key is to continue. Continue to live in him. How? By being rooted. That's another way of saying abide, right? To be rooted means you're not going anywhere. You're there, you're rooted, you're abiding, you're remaining and built up. That's the thriving part. That's the part where we bear fruit. So listen, John 15, 5 puts it this way. First, you got to abide, then you thrive. Colossians 2 puts it this way. First, you root, then you fruit. fruit. Exactly. <laughs> you got to root to fruit. <clears throat> and wherever you root will determine your fruit. Because how many of us know in 2024, all of us are going to root our lives in something. There are many people for whom 2024 will be a year that they root their lives in their work, in their jobs, in their career. And while this may yield the temporary fruit of achievements, of stability, of you know, uh, recognition, it might also yield some unwanted fruit. Like how about the fruit of burnout? The fruit of neglecting personal relationships. The fruit of having an imbalance in our time and in our schedules. A lot of people will root their lives in materialism and consumerism. And while this may yield status and temporary happiness, it might also yield excessive debt, which is why we need to take Financial Peace University. Maybe in the new year, we want to be better stewards. It could also uh, yield impulsivity to chase after the latest and the greatest thing or a fleeting sense of fulfillment because those things never satisfy. Many people root their lives in social media and technology looking for validation, connection, and self-worth. But they may also yield the fruit of comparison. They may also yield the fruit of insecurity or of a distorted sense of reality. A lot of people are getting on a health kick. You know, I'm trying to learn more about being healthy. But if we're not careful and we root our lives only in health and wellness, we may re re reap some benefits. But if we're not careful, we may also reap obsession 
anxiety, and tying our sense of value to our physical appearance or our overall well-being. How many of us know 2024 is an election year, which means there are going to be many people who root their lives in political ideologies and find their identity in politics. And what they're looking for is a sense of purpose and belonging. But what they may also yield is the fruit of polarization, the fruit of division, the fruit of an us versus them mentality. So you see, there are many things that we could root our lives in in the new year. But God calls us to root our lives in him. Not in work, not in materialism, not in health, not in media, not in politics. Be rooted in Jesus this year because only by being rooted in him will our lives bear true fruit, fruit that lasts and brings rest to our souls. So the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, okay, how do we abide in Christ? What does it look like to stay connected to Jesus? I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this, Pastor Mark, but Jesus hasn't exactly been around in well over 2,000 years. So what do you mean, be connected to Jesus? He's kind of MIA, isn't he? I mean, look around. He hasn't been around. And this is the exact predicament that Jesus' disciples found themselves in when Jesus told them that he was ascending back into heaven. They felt abandoned. They felt neglected. They're freaking out. But look at the radical promise that Jesus makes to them and to us as well about how we can continue to remain tight with Jesus even after he ascends back into heaven. Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But watch this. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Moving on to the next slide. Jesus continues, Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. What Jesus is saying is, look, I know it sounds bad, like I'm abandoning you, like I'm leaving you as orphans, but listen, I will come back to you. How? You just said you were leaving. I will come back to you, and and listen, it will be better than it is now. What are you talking about, Jesus? What could be better than this? You're sitting right in front of us. What could be better than having Jesus right in front of us? And Jesus says, yes, this is amazing. But listen, it's for your good that I leave because then my Father will send the Holy Spirit. And if you think this is good for me to be with you, wait till I'm living within you. We will be so close then. It will be better than it is now. And I have to imagine that even after Jesus is saying all this, his disciples are still like, I'm not getting it, right? What could be better than this? It sort of reminds me of a scene from one of my favorite movies growing up, which was uh, Star Wars. And um, in the first Star Wars, Star Wars A New Hope, there's this iconic scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi is dueling Darth Vader on the bridge of the Death Star, right? And they're having this epic duel, but right in the middle of their battle, Obi-Wan says a really strange thing to the Dark Lord. He turns to him, and he says to him, You cannot win, Darth. Even if you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you could ever imagine. And as if to prove his point, he lowers his lightsaber, and with his friends all watching, Darth Vader comes and just strikes him down, and he disappears. And Luke Skywalker, right, he's like a disciple of of Obi-Wan, he's freaking out. Because his master, his teacher, he's gone, right? Darth Vader just defeated him, and Luke feels like abandoned, right? He feels like, he just left me. 
He left me. But for those of us who have seen the movie, did Obi-Wan die in that moment? Not really. Spoiler alert. You had some time to watch it. It came out in the 70s, okay? (laughs) Spoiler alert. He does not die in that moment. He becomes one with the force. He becomes a force ghost, which means that now he can train Luke wherever he goes. He's no longer bound by time and space. He's no longer bound by a physical body. He can be with Luke Skywalker wherever he goes. He can still influence the events of this world from the beyond and even thwart the plans of the evil emperor. Why am I telling you all this? (laughs) Because it's very similar. I think George Lucas must have read the New Testament. I think George Lucas read John 15, 5 because that's very similar to what's happening in this scene right? Jesus' disciples are freaking out. Ah, Jesus just left us, right? But listen, Obi-Wan did not cease to exist. He merely took on a different form of existence, and actually, it was a greater form. In the same way, Jesus did not cease to exist. He simply took on a different form of existence, and it's actually, in his words, a greater form. Because now, no longer was he just with us, but by the power of his spirit, he now lives within us. He's no longer bound by time and space. He's no longer bound by a physical body. If we wanted to spend time with Jesus today, we'd have to book a ticket to Israel and go be with him. But we don't have to do that. Why? We can be with him every moment of every day. He lives in us. He he can lead us and guide us wherever we go. He can still influence the events of our life. Do you see? And so Jesus said, it is for your good that I leave so that the Father can send the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, even greater things than I will you do. And so this is an amazing, amazing reality. But if you think about it, it's kind of lofty. It's kind of lofty to think about having a relationship with the Spirit, (laughs) right? It would be so much easier if we could see him, if he was tangible. That's what we're used to. And that's why we're going to spend an entire year unpacking and exploring this reality of doing life with the person of Jesus as the Holy Spirit, because it's going to take some time for us to to learn this together. But listen, if you hear nothing else this morning, I pray that you hear this. You see, Jesus knew that when he ascended back into heaven, his disciples would be tempted to return back to religion. That's where they came from. But Jesus was intentionally calling them to remain in relationship. He's saying, you're going to want to go back to religion. Don't do that. Remain in me. Remain in relationship with me. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, Jesus has not walked the earth in over 2,000 years. And the sad reality is that many of his followers, they have replaced him with religion. But we were never meant to return to religion. We were always meant to remain in relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is not meant to be a list of rules and regulations, a a, a list of religious works. It's not meant to be a, 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 a list of do's and don'ts. The Christian life was always meant to be a personal, intimate relationship with the creator of the universe through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we miss that, we miss everything. We, we miss it all. There is no power in striving. Striving leads to dying, but abiding leads to thriving. If we simply strive and do our religious works, we will bear no fruit. Think of it this way. Imagine a young woman who spent her entire life growing up in a remote rural village that has really no access to very much. Now imagine this young woman taking her very first steps into a bustling metropolitan city. Imagine how in awe she would be. And she, she just stares in disbelief. She's just dazzled by the array of electric lights. 
Never seen anything like this before. She's so moved by this that she grabs her pack that she came with, and she goes to the nearest hardware store, and she just starts loading up that pack with as many light bulbs as she possibly can. She throws a light switch in there because she's just so eager to bring this newfound marvel back to her people. Well, upon returning to the village, she, she excitedly begins adorning the whole village with light bulbs. She's hanging them from the front of her house. You know, she's hanging them from her neighbor's trees. And everyone's just starting to come out of their, their huts, and they're just all bewildered. They're just, like, puzzled by her strange... They're asking her, what are you doing? And she just smiles politely at them, and she says, just wait. Wait until nightfall. You'll see. Well, as darkness envelops the village... Everyone gathers around her, and she just goes to the light switch that she, I guess, nailed to a wall. And, uh, you know, she smiles at all of them, and she flicks on the switch, expecting this amazing transformation. But, of course, the light bulbs remain lifeless. (laughs) Why? Because no one told her about electricity, (laughs) about how these bulbs are useless, unless they are connected to the source of power. And in the same way, there are so many people who chase after societal expectations. The things we're told to adorn our life with, career, education, relationships, belongings, material wealth, all these things that we adorn in our life, thinking that these things will brighten our lives. But when life's darkness descends, when you find yourself reaching for meaning and fulfillment, sadly, there are many people flipping on the switch, but to no avail. And Jesus likens this to our dependency on him, saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. And how many of us, how many people live like those unlit bulbs because they're disconnected from the source of true life, true light, true purpose? You see, you and I were created to live in connection with something, someone greater than ourselves, Jesus. And as our lives are connected to him, only then can we truly shine brightly in this world. He's the one who brings purpose and light and life to every area of our life. But we have to stay connected to the source of power. This year, I want to encourage every single one of us to stay connected to the source of life. Throughout this entire year, we're going to get extremely practical on what it looks like to remain in Jesus. And we're going through a number of different things together as the body that are going to help us to stay connected to Jesus. And I just pray that this would be a year where we abide in him. Because if we turn to anything else, nothing else in this life will be able to sustain us like Jesus. I want to close this morning with a story. And uh, there's a story about this young new believer in Jesus who sought the wisdom of an older Christian man. And the reason why he wanted to talk to him is because from what he'd heard, this elderly gentleman had never lost his first love for Jesus, even after many long years of following Christ. And so this young man showed up to his house, and he found the elderly gentleman sat on his porch with his dog, taking in a beautiful sunset. And the young man posed this question to his elder. He said, sir, why is it, do you think, that so many people lose their fire, lose their zeal for Jesus after just about a year or two of following him? They revert into this routine of weekly church attendance, but really their lives look no different than their unbelieving friends and neighbors. And yet people say that you're not like that. People say that you have not lost your passion for Jesus even after all these long years. People say you're different. Why? Why are you different? And the old man smiled. They said, son, let me tell you a story. 
He said, one day I was sitting on my porch just like this with my dog. And all of a sudden, this large white rabbit just runs across our yard. And my dog just jumps to his feet and he just starts tearing across the yard, chasing after this rabbit. And this passionate chase begins. And my dog just began to chase that rabbit all over the countryside. Well, his barking began to attract the attention of other dogs who joined in the chase. And what a sight it was, this pack of dogs tearing all over the countryside, going up creeks, up embankments, and even through thickets and thorns. He said, but as time went on, dogs began to slowly give up on the chase. One by one, they began to quit and just go home. Maybe the terrain was too difficult for them. Maybe the chase became too frustrating for them, but they just began to give up until only my dog remained in the chase. He said, son, in that story is the answer to your question. And the young man just sat there puzzled. And he thought about the story for some time, but Finally, he, he just spoke up. He said, sir, I, I'm sorry, but I'm confused. How does a rabbit chase, what does a rabbit chase have to do with pursuing God? And the old man said, the reason you fail to catch the lesson of the story is because you failed to ask the right question, the obvious question, which was, why didn't the other dogs continue the chase? And the answer to that question is, because they didn't see the rabbit. They were merely following the other dogs. Only my dog saw the prize, and he kept his eyes on the prize, and he never gave up the chase. My question to you this morning is, have you seen Jesus? Have you really seen Jesus? Because unless you keep your eye on the prize, who is Jesus? Not religion, not rules, not works, but Jesus. He's the only one who can sustain you. That's the only way that you will be able to endure the Christian life and not give up on the chase. Because religion <laughs> will wear you out. You'll give up. You'll become discouraged. But if you keep your eyes on the prize, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, if you stay connected to him, if you remain in his presence day in and day out, he will sustain you for the rest of your life. And so this week, as much as I love Sunday, Sunday is great. I love this time that we get to come together as the body. But this is just one of many moments this week, I pray, that we will spend with God. This is just one of many moments that we will spend in His presence. So this week, I, I implore you, I encourage you, as you go from this place, make time to be with Jesus. Be intentional about spending time with Him. Keep your eye on the prize. As I said earlier, we have been in an amazing 21-day church devotional. And we just had an amazing first week, but I don't think we're full to capacity yet. I think there's still room. And so if you have not yet joined our daily Devo, I want to encourage you to jump in. It's not too late. Scan that QR code. Join us every morning or whatever in the day, sometimes I'm late to the party, uh, we do the devotional. And then what's really, really cool about it is there's a video. It's amazing. I think this is one of the best devos we've ever done together. There's a video teaching. There's a devotional. There's a short passage that we all read together. But I got to say probably one of my favorite parts about this is that there's a little message forum after where we all get to chime in and talk about what we're learning. And I got to say, Hearing from the brothers and sisters about how the Lord is speaking to them is probably as encouraging as the devotional itself. I want to share with you what one sister shared this past week in our time of devotion. She said, I'm learning more and more about God and his love. I used to think rest meant to relax, but now I feel like rest in this context, talking about the, the verse, 
is to pray more. A brother shared a similar revelation. He said, for me, the idea of rest seems ever more unattainable as life seems to get busier and busier. But I think to the life of Jesus and the practical busyness of all that he accomplished while on earth, and I'm realizing that rest isn't necessarily as finite as I tend to look at it. Yes, physical rest is important, but there's a truer sense of resting in the spiritual where I can abide with the Father just like Jesus did that is so much more important. I definitely want to take the fresh start that comes with a new year to grow in the discipline of abiding in Him. See, God's been teaching us about this thing called rest. We've been told that rest is simply to cease working, to relax, to recreate. And those are all good things. Don't get me wrong. But listen, true rest for your soul, true rest that nourishes your spirit and gives you hope and gives you joy and gives you passion in life, that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And so how do we rest in him this week? Many different ways. Like I said, join us in this daily devotional. Join the conversation. It's been an amazing week and it's not too late to join. Another way is just, just to put on worship music and to sit in his presence. How many of you are blessed by our worship team every weekend and just how they lead us in that time of abiding and remaining? And I get it. I wish I could pack Micah in my trunk, bring him home, and have him do this for me like all day long. But short of that, I can... Play music in my house, in my home, in my car. I can worship in the car, right? And, and, and there's so many ways we could just sit in his presence and abide in him. So this past week, Jaylee and I started the 40-day fast with many of you. And man, it has just been such an amazing first week of the 40 days already. So for us, every year, we fast or uh, I, I don't know if fast is the right word, but we take a break from all forms of recreational media. So what is that? Any type of media that is recreational, <laughs> entertainment. So that's social media, Instagram, Facebook, it's Netflix, it's all streaming platforms, it's movies, it's everything. We take a break for, from all of that for 40 days. And let me tell you, this first week has been amazing. Because usually what happens is the kids go down at around 8 give or take. And then for about a couple of hours, Jaylee and I just have time to ourselves before we go to bed. Now, confession time, before the 40-day fast, it would just be so easy to fill that time with just mindless scrolling, just vegging out at the end of a long day, right? We're sending each other funny memes. We're sitting right next to each other on the couch. <laughs> You're, this is you. <laughs> you know, just sending each other these memes, sitting right next to each other. Or we'll just throw on a movie, and before you know it, oh, time for bed, you know. Didn't, not really filled, but that's just the way that we end our day. But listen, ever since the 40-day fast, it's been night and day. We've been praying together. That was awesome. We prayed for the new year together one evening. Or we'll just go off and find a place to be and just soak in God's presence alone with worship music. Man, it's just been so nourishing to the soul. I looked over one evening as we were sitting in bed. She had a book out and I had a book out. I was like, who are we all of a sudden? We're reading. This is amazing. We're reading books. Guys, get this. This, this will blow your mind, okay? We, we usually sit on the couch on our phones, but listen, we put the phones down and, and watch this. We actually turned to face each other. And then we opened our mouth and words came out and we had a conversation. I know, it's crazy. I know, it's crazy. But that's what we, we talk now. We have conversations and, you know, it's like, it's awesome, you know. But I got to tell you, man, it's like, there's like this knee-jerk reaction where without even, like involuntarily, I'll just reach for my phone or I'll just reach for the remote. It's like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like involuntary, but, but I love that that happens. Because in that moment where I'm tempted to go for my phone or I'm tempted to go for the remote, it's like a cue for me. Like, hey, pause. Instead of going for that, what can you do to abide in Jesus? Instead of reaching for the things that you default to, instead of just knee-jerk grabbing, let's be honest, the emotional potato chips, right? 
Let's go for something that's really going to nourish us, that's really going to feed us, that's really going to fill us. And man, after just one week of this, man, I'm feeling so much better about this new year. I'm feeling so much more rested. I'm feeling so much more excited. And I'm looking forward to the rest of our 40-day fast together. So I want to encourage you, find something that you default to. Find something that you just kind of knee-jerk turn to. And what you do is you make that the thing that you take a break from and you fill that time with Jesus. Now listen, it can be so tempting to want to fill that time with some other activity. And I'm, I'm guilty of that too. But I'm trying to train myself, okay, how can I spend this time with Jesus? How can I spend this time with Jesus? And I'm believing that as we continue to root in these 40 days, we will bear much fruit. Amen? As we continue to abide, we will thrive. So let's all stand together and let's close in a word of prayer this morning. And I want to just seal us to that today. Pray that over, that for, over us this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much for this time. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we can come together on Sunday mornings, that we can be together as the body of Christ. Lord, I look so forward to this time. I know many of us do look forward to this time of coming together, of being in your presence, and of worshiping you together. But God, as amazing as this time is, I pray that it would just be one of many times this week that we spend time in your presence, that we abide in you. May we be like that, that jar sealed in your Holy Spirit all week long, just marinating in you. May we find times throughout this week that we can remain on the vine. Maybe it's through our time of church-wide daily devotions. Maybe it'll be turning on some worship, worship music during our commute to the office and just spending that car ride soaking in your presence. Maybe as we take our lunch break, as we offer up a prayer for the food that we're about to receive, we can spend a little more time just thanking you for the day, praying for whatever projects or, or things we're working on, and maybe even praying for an opportunity to be your light wherever we are for the rest of the afternoon. And then God, in the evening time, before our head hits the pillow, Will we just pause again, Lord? Would our screens not be the last thing we see? Would your face be the last thing that we see at the end of the day? As we sit in your presence, as we praise you for the day, as we worship you, and as we commit our evening and the next day to you, Lord. And I'm just believing, God, as we cultivate a lifestyle of remaining, man, the fruit is going to be tremendous. It's going to be off the charts. This is going to be the most fruitful year we have ever experienced as we spur one another on to remain on the vine and to thrive in you. I pray that over every single one of my brothers and sisters this morning, I pray that over every home and every family, would we find true rest for our souls in you this year. We thank you and praise you. We give you all the glory. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Would you seal that with a clap offering this morning? Hallelujah.